Well, thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, uh, my name is Kai Li. I'm a, a professor at Princeton University. Uh, today I'm talking about the, uh, a project uh, we're collaborating with Intel. Um, I'm building a real-time closed-loop uh, fMRI data analysis system for uh, neuroscience experiments. Um, uh, the, the collaborators are listed over there are uh, uh, from Princeton, uh, part of from Princeton, the others from Intel. Uh, people from Princeton are, are uh, John Cohen and Nick Turk Brown or a uh, neuroscientist. So first, I'd like to just briefly talk about what is uh, fMRIs. Um, fMRI is a machine that's similar to the fMRI machine we're familiar with, but uh, with a few differences. Um, one is that uh, it, it is uh, the goal for fMRI is not to uh, produce a very high resolution brain image. Instead, uh, produce uh, fairly coarse uh, uh, resolution images, but can uh, produce a human brain uh, very quickly. It can measure the uh, brain activities um, de by detecting changes associated with the blood flow, or so called the blood oxygen level dependent or bold activities. So as you are moving, uh, so when a person sitting in a uh, fMRI scanner, uh, he or she can actually see um, a display. Um, and uh, the display will tell the person a certain task to, to perform. While you're performing tasks, your brain um, blood oxygen level will start changing um, depending on which region of the brain doing what. And uh, that will give you the data uh, uh, for neuroscience to perform studies. So how do people do this? I think this has been, people have been using fMRI machine for, since the 90s. Um, typically, um, <coughs> the traditional way of doing it is to use the so-called activity-based analysis. Uh, what they do is that uh, uh, in the you know, in theory, in neuroscience, um, there are a lot of theories about which region of the brain uh, doing uh, perform what. Um, but now, with a functional MRI machine, you'll be able to um, look at those uh, brain volume and uh, measure its activities and figure it out conform if you're performing certain task, which region of the brain uh, get used in you know in what way. So this has, um, uh, neuroscientists have been doing this for a long time. Um, but this kind of study has a, a couple of limitations. One is um, you only measure the activities. <laughs> but <laughs> in order to measure the interactions among multiple regions, you will need to look at um, the relationship between regions, not just which regions have signals. So uh, it's almost like a, if you look at the uh, a, you know, um, multiple nodes in a network, but uh, activities, you only look at those nodes, but you don't look at the network. So if you look at a network, you have to figure out the relationship, who, how they interact with each other. So, um, uh, to do that, then you you would need to figure out the correlations among multiple uh, regions or uh, <coughs> among the <coughs> excuse me uh, among the uh, voxels in the brain. So that kind of study we call full correlation studies. So that's uh, relatively new, and uh, so activity based as well as a correlation-based studies would be able to drive our understanding about human brain to a, um, a new level. So the project we're working on uh, can probably be demonstrated using this diagram. This is a, we're trying to pr 
uh, build a neuroscience data analysis service, not just uh, some software. But what this service does is that you can connect uh, an, a functional MRI machine um, to, um, to the service over the internet. And uh, you can, uh, as the human subject sitting in the, um, in the functional MRI machine, and the machine will start producing those human brains, typically one to two seconds uh, each and then send it over the internet to the service. And the, the neuroscience data analysis service on, on the back end of the cloud would be able to process the data and send the analysis results back. And um, uh, so if you're doing offline uh, data analysis, you just keep you know, scanning the, the person's brain and send it to the back end. Once you have enough uh, data, then you perform a study. Then the, um, the service will tell you what the analysis results are. And also, we provide another mode, which is a real-time closed loop service, which means that when a person sitting in the scanner, you start scanning the human brain and get sent over to the service in real time, meaning that within uh, a second or two, will be able to send uh, real-time feedback all the way to this display, the stimuli, uh, stimuli display uh, the human can actually see. And um, I will talk a little bit later about why, we're, why this is interesting. So first, I will talk about the offline data analysis part, since the real-time systems actually build uh, on top of the, the offline data analysis. Okay, so before doing that, let me uh, uh, first talk about the data stream a little bit. So the data stream, uh, the uh, fMRI data stream, as I mentioned, every second and a half, you produce a human brain. So for one human subject, for example, you, have, you just have those streams coming in, in all the time. And while the person, on the other hand, the person is pre performing certain tasks. So you label which brain is, which set of brains associated with which kind of task. In uh, neuroscience, um, you know, fMRI terminology, we, we call that IPOC. Each IPOC typically has uh, maybe 10 to 20 brains. This is during this time, the person is seeing certain, doing certain kind of task. That's the region of interest. Then uh, after that, you switch the person to do something else, uh, to do a not different task. Between the IPOC, there will be some gap. But in the offline data analysis data, those gaps actually get removed. So you just have different kind of a multiple IPOC um, uh, labeled in the, each, uh, uh, each data stream. And uh, you, to do a study, you also have um, multiple human subjects data in the same data set, right? Because the time dimension, this is actually a 4D data. Uh, uh, human brain is a, a, a 3D data that's just full of voxels. Then plus the time dimension, you have 4D data. So for example, uh, uh, one of the simple tasks for a person to see is to see uh, the uh, scenes of, uh, you, you see the, uh, the human subject see face, human face in the, in the image. And that's, that's uh, perhaps one kind of task, just recognizing the, the human faces. The other is to see scenes. And it's known in neuroscience that when you see face, um, using certain part of the brain. And when you see scenes, you actually use a different part of the brain. And when you do such a switching, then when you see face, you, that's a one uh, IPOC. And uh, when you switch to scene, you, you see a different IPOC, right? So in this data set, for example, um, the neuroscientists perform, so in this case, each brain has 
uh, close to 35,000 voxels. And uh, for each epoch, you have uh, 12 brain volumes. And the whole, for each human subject, they go through this 12 epochs uh, per subject. And uh, there are 18 subjects in this data set. For example, this would be an example data set. This is a relatively small data set, and there are many other data sets may be slightly bigger. Um, so if you want to compute correlations, as I said, that would be unbiased, uh, exhaustive search of all the relationship between voxels, and that would uh, let us figure out the, the interactions between um, uh, human brain voxels. So we imagine that a particular voxel in one of the human brain in this data stream, if you have to uh, compute the uh, correlation with all other voxels within the same brain as well as in other brains in the data stream, that's a lot of computi computing, right? And because there's, a, there's that time dimension too. So if you look at that data set I just mentioned, um, facing data set. If you truly compute full correlations for each subject, and uh, that will, you need to compute 220 trillion correlations. That will require 1.8 petabytes of memory to store. That's just you know, uh, not even trackable with this small data set, right? So what? So the newer scientists would need to come in to figure out what, uh, what are the correlations actually useful, meaningful in newer science perspective, and what are or not. Then you can do some great reduction at the higher level. So one way to do this would be to do, you only compute for correlation for each epoch. So each epoch, remember, we have 12 uh, human brains, we actually uh, compute Pearson correlations. But instead of uh, uh, st strictly doing that, we actually reduce that to a matrix multiplication. And that becomes uh, 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 each, um, for each epoch, you have, you produce one correlation matrix um, that's uh, about 35,000 by 35,000 matrix. By doing this, you have about 120 billion correlations and you need about one terabyte storage, which is very much manageable in a, a, even a small cluster. So, um, so let me just run, the, briefly tell what the algorithm is. You compute, first you compute correlations for all the voxels, right? This, this is a meaning that um, for voxels, you produce one matrix for each epoch. Second, then you need to normalize those correlations for each subject with other subjects. And then you do voxel selection and classification. Um, so the challenges for doing this is that even with that reduction, I think if we just compute correlations, Pearson correlation would take about nine hours on a server. But that doesn't take that much time. The classification have to do a lot more. It would need to do cross-validation. And uh, that would take over 600 days if you do a uh, back-end ca calculation. So, um, but what we want is to be able to finish this computation, even offline, in minutes or seconds, right? Um, so what we do in the... Uh, in terms of infrastructures, uh, with uh, Intel and NSF help, we set up a cluster at Princeton. Also, Arista uh, uh, contribute a 10 gig network switch. Basically, we have 50 nodes server. Each has a, a two uh, Xeon E5 CPUs and also two uh, Xeon Phi um, uh, uh, PCR cards and uh, with a 10 gig connection. This is a our compute infrastructure, and which has a, a the Xeon has a, a if you put all the resources together, essentially we have about eight hundred 
Xeon E5 CPU cores and 6,000 Xeon 5 CPU cores and uh, 1.2 petabytes of disk storage, um, 65 uh, terabytes of flash, and uh, 12 uh, terabytes of uh, RAM total. So uh, on this, to use this infrastructure, you have to do power, you know, to use them well, um, what we do is we just use a master slave, uh, sort of master worker type of a, uh, uh, framework. Essentially, you send a brain data or data set, uh, the master take on that and divide the job into smaller pieces and send it to different workers. And it, what, when the data set comes in, the raw data set is actually not that big. The, what's big is the correlation. So once you start computing correlation, they start to explode. So you want to replicate the raw data on all the nodes. Then uh, creating those tasks by partitioning the raw data into voxels. So you basically assign certain number of voxels to each worker and assign those workers take on the task and start performing. And depending on what kind of job the worker do, do and the worker may hand um, finish the work to somebody else and so on and so forth. So this is the, the model. This model has, um, has another advantage, which is the if um, you have a node failure, and particular, for example, uh, consider a, a node that running a worker uh, task fail, then the master can figure out uh, the node failure and assign that job to a new worker. So this uh, um, this framework allow us to implement fault tolerance. So uh, the the, uh, the compu computing for full correlation studies uh, as those algorithm steps I, I outlined before is a uh, fairly parallel. It's belong to the embarrassingly parallel category, I think. So the key is really to optimize each worker task uh, to do well. So if you look at the pipeline a little further, the, um, the, there are three stages, right? The first stage is compute correlation. As I mentioned before, you compute a one um, matrix per IPOC. And so uh, depending on how many IPOCs you have among all su human subjects, then you need to compute that many uh, com um, correlation matrices. And then the second, second stage is to do within subject normalization. And for each IPOC, uh, but each matrix, uh, com uh, correlation matrix, uh, the voxels you're, you're responsible for as a worker, you need to go through other uh, 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 matrices and, and, uh, and normalize them. So they will be in the same uh, value range. Finally, you want to do voxel selection and classification. That typically has two phases. <coughs> it has the, the first phase is to compute the kernel matrices and then do cross validation. So, all, throughout all three stages, we basically follow the partition of the data at the very beginning. Um, uh, each worker actually will take uh, about 100, between 100 and 200 voxels and work through all the way to the end, essentially. So this will reduce communication and uh, give, uh, 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 take advantage, full advantage of the, uh, the uh, resource available in the cluster. So in terms of optimization, um, what optimization do we do? Um, I think they, we, we know that the key to the modern processor, there are really three main things you need to do to get things run fast, right? The first is to uh, fully utilize the vector units, uh, whether you are on Xeon um, CPU or on Xeon Phi, especially on Xeon Phi. You got to be able to uh, fully utilize the vector units. And the second is to be able to use multiple cores and uh, uh, to make sure they um, they do, they perform very well, and uh, uh, 
you don't lock up among them. And uh, the third is we reduce cache misses. If you have cache misses, your vector unit or multi-core would not perform very well. So um, as the gap, uh, even though uh, the CPU clock rate is essentially stabilized, but the gap between um, uh, CPU cycle and the memory uh, fetch is still very long. It, it's a, a factor of a hundred, a, th a few hundreds. So uh, we did a quite a bit of a optimization. That's uh, um, the details would be in the uh, technical paper in the, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, my student Ida would present that. Essentially, we have four ideas I'm just going to outline here without giving a lot of details. Uh, the first is to do uh, blocking for very you know, strangely shaped matrix. So here, uh, it's very skinny and tall matrices because the voxel, we have 35,000 voxels, but each, each task only take 100 or so. So that's a uh, in fact, when we do blocking, we take individual voxels, try to do um, uh, to uh, to work uh, uh, for each thread, such that we can reduce a lot of cache misses. The second is that uh, uh, as you go through the uh, pipeline stage, we found that later pipeline stage, adjacent pipeline stage, may actually use need to use the data produced uh, from the previous pipeline stage. Now, you could wait until the whole pipeline stage finishes and start with the second pipeline stage, but, uh, but that may cause a lot of cache misses. So in order to uh, further reduce cache misses, you may want to retain the cache content going through the second stage um, and uh, as opposed to strictly follow the pipeline stage. Um, that's the trade-off between modularization of code and uh, uh, performance. And the third is to really careful about data layout, even when you uh, write uh, uh, output data structure of, uh, uh, in the program. And this just uh, throughout the whole program, make sure your data structure always designed well for a vector unit. And then finally, parallel, doing parallelization for multi-core as well as for um, multiple nodes. So how about if, when you apply those four ideas, what, how big the difference would become? So the single, single node improvement, and this is a, if you, the baseline is the optimized code you do all the optimization possible, but except you're using Intel MKL and uh, lib SVM, this is the for classification, um, for their APIs. And if you do all that, that's the baseline. Then, uh, then you do optimization, substituting libraries, and you doing further optimization of those four ideas. Then the, on Xeon Phi, we, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, for two data sets, one is the face and scene, the other is attention. We, we essentially see the uh, uh, improvement uh, by factor five to factor 16. So that's a very large uh, improvement. If you look at the, that optimization, uh, if you look at the running the same code on e, uh, Xeon E5 versus Xeon 5, you, you know, you can make uh, two observations. One is that um, the baseline case, um, Xeon 5 runs faster. This is a speed up, right? Uh, Normalized uh, to Xeon uh, E5. So um, you just look at one figure. I mean, this is two data sets, right? So on the baseline, you can see that um, uh, Xeon Phi is a slower in the first case by a uh, factor of maybe 1.8 or so. The other is almost factor of uh, four uh, s slower. Um, but for optimized version, um, Xeon Phi would be, a, the first case is a maybe 2.2 2 
factor 2.2 faster, the other is 1.6 uh, times faster than uh, Z, uh, E5. Well, the other observation is that uh, the optimization actually also improved the, the performance on Xeon. In the first case, probably by a factor of 1.4, the other is by a factor of uh, 2.5. So their optimization carries over. So those optimizations are good optimization for uh, even for Xeon. So even this was designed for Xeon Phi. So what, once you have done all those optimization and uh, run on the, in the offline performance, we, as we add the number of nodes, this is all Xeon Phi's, from 1, 8, 16, 32, 64, 96. We have a total of uh, 100, but some of the nodes fail, right? So we could run on 96. So for the face of scene data, data set I described, that will complete offline analysis in 85 seconds. That's just a little over a minute. Um, and that's uh, very acceptable by neuroscientists. The attention data set is larger, and uh, uh, it just has more human subjects, also more IPOC. So this is a 540 as opposed to 216 total. And uh, that will finish uh, 700 some seconds. That's uh, over 10 minutes. Uh, uh, we still wish that to be faster, but, you know, I, but I think the point is that this uh, uh, approach seems to be scalable. So as you add more, if you have more hardware resources, you may be able to further improve this. So uh, after building this, right, and uh, I think the, the goal is to, to run neuroscience experiments. And the question is, uh, can we find out anything interesting in neuroscience, right? So uh, our collaboration with the neuroscientists have done such a study, just compare activity-based analysis versus the correlation based, right? So and, uh, last follow seconds, the time of the unit? Uh, yes, that's in seconds, yeah, sorry. Yeah, for offline, I think this is uh, acceptable. Real time is not. I will talk about real time next. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, what you hope is to be able to get in seconds, probably. I think a minute is probably okay. 10 minutes is still tolerable but for this level of complication. I think if you scale, you can, if we can scale the hardware by a factor by order of magnitude, then we can get even the attention data set, we can get that down to uh, a minute, right? So uh, the good news is that, you know, this is the, uh, the trajectory is good. I mean, it looks like <laughs> scalable. There's really in the system, there's no place that's really stop us from performing better when you add more hardware. Okay. So uh, um, this is a uh, a study just using that face and scene data set to drive the, uh, this study. Then what we found is that the correlation uh, based analysis was able to find um, regions of uh, uh, signals in uh, other, in the unknown regions that uh, neuroscientists knew before. This is very exciting for them. Um, um, the regions marked in the correlation-based analysis indicate which regions are doing communication, not just the activities. The activity bases are done very well. This is all, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the p-value, this is all very um, uh, significant signals, right? Uh, so this is uh, extremely exciting for a neuroscientist that, and uh, uh, you know, this is uh, why we're, we want to pr pursue this and in order to uh, face the, the grand challenge to understand how human brain works. For a human to understand is their own brains or our own brains, how they work and they ought to be more challenging than anything else. So 
So that's just my quick overview about off offline. Uh, so for the remaining time, I want to talk about the uh, real time. Um, why real time closed loop, right? Um, so my colleagues at Princeton Neuroscience Institute have performed using activity-based study. They have performed um, uh, closed loop training of attention. So basically, what they have done is that they do data. You do data acquisition, then you do some pre-processing, then you use the uh, uh, activity-based study to do classification. Basically, trying to figure out the state of uh, the attention condition of that person, of that human subject, right? Then you send feedback tasks, easier or harder task, to the human um, subject. If you're uh, in the correct attention, um, you will start using easier tasks. But if you are uh, start reducing your attention, your attention state is not good, it will provide harder tasks for you to do. And it will update this stimulus display. And, uh, uh, and then you monitor what happened, measure what happened. This is the, the kind of training they do. So here's an example. Um, uh, I would, uh, uh, so the category recording on top of there, this is a small video. Uh, but those slides are given by my colleagues. And this stimulus uh, property. So you can sort of see the kind of stuff they do. Uh, so this is a face and scene overlapped. But the amount of overlapping depends on uh, you assume a subject is asked you to figure out the scene without um, figure out the face, face become noise. Or ask you to look at the face, and, the, and then the scene would become um, noise, right? So then we record uh, your um, stimulus proportion versus the uh, attended, you know, attended category. So this is the sequence of a face and scene you know, used in this training. So what's interesting about this kind of study is that they will discover that uh, with the feedback group compared with the control group, and there's a huge difference, meaning that training is helpful for improving the uh, improving uh, human's attention. And uh, also, the, you, if you look at the classic, those classification, the, it becomes clear. And the gap becomes bigger. So, uh, so that's the interesting this study that published in Nature uh, Neuroscience uh, uh, this year. They, what's, I think what's exciting here is that uh, in the real-time closed loop, environment, you'll be able to manipulate the human brain right, by training. And then you start asking the question, what else can I do to manipulate the human brain? That, you know, so that becomes a, a very interesting study, especially if you understand the, uh, if, you, if you, we can do that with an unbiased uh, full correlation study, then with the interaction information, you can manipulate more, you can do more in neuroscience. So now, um, how do we do this? This, uh, you know, the scanner acquired data is sent a human brain every second and a half, and you do some pre-processing, just like uh, using the activation-based system. Now you do classification, then you do feedback. Right? I mean, this is the same as before, except now uh, I just want to point out that you. For neural feedback, if you want to real time, you got to finish within a second and a half, or about that amount of time. So the design goal for doing this would be: you want to, uh, since we're building a service, we well, actually the service allow multiple uh, fMRI scanners to connect to the to this to real time service, and if we do this, we'll be able to not just Princeton will be able to do experiments 
anyone would be able to experiment. For example, uh, one of the known, you know, certain known clinical applications, for example, uh, would be able to f using fMRI, functional MRI, to figure out whether a person's brain function properly. Um, you know, let's say if in a in a football match, if somebody got injured and you suspect that person have a concussion, could you know if you have a scanner in the back room and you can get this player off the court and put into the scanner in real time service, you can figure out whether this person truly have a concussion or not. Either you send back to the field or go back for treatment, right? So you can imagine for clinical application, but if you conduct neuroscience studies, any team uh, in the world, as long as you have an internet connection that have enough bandwidth to send your brain, you'll be able to use the service to do study. So they we're trying to enable the community to do something interesting. But you have to be able to uh, provide real-time feedback every second half. And you want to reuse resource well. You don't want to do as fast as possible. You want to use the minimum amount of resources, computer resources, to, uh, to be able to provide real-time services. Those are the challenges. You also want to tolerate no failure. You don't want you want to be able to recover within a short period of time. So the challenge is that one challenge we, we have found <coughs> the fMRI scanners were made by different vendors. Even the same vendor, we have no idea what they have been doing in their box. So, but whatever is going on is the processing time before they send out the brain vary. It varies even a single machine. It will vary between 200 to 800 milliseconds. <coughs> so you also have <coughs> excuse me, heterogeneous resources, different kind of uh, machines. The different, different machines have different nodes, have different amount of memory resources, different number of CPU cores, and so on and you want to be able to tolerate failure. So that's, those are the, the challenges for building real-time system. Uh, although this is not a hard real-time, I mean, if you provide stimuli, feed, neural feedback, a bit delay, a couple second delay, probably wouldn't make a big difference in the big picture, but you don't want to delay all the time, right? So you want to try to do as best as possible. So if you look at the real-time pipeline, then it's actually very similar to the offline. One is that you, now you can treat the matrix for, you don't have to compute matrix, uh, co correlation matrix for all epochs. You just compute for the current epoch. So that's simple. Just one for each epoch, maybe 10 or 20 um, brain volumes to produce one correlation matrix. And the, the second stage is become simpler because you, the new data is only one correlation matrix. So you only need to do uh, normalization for that one. So if you hand the voxel, certain number of voxels to a worker, the worker only need to do very little. And so really think about that you're adding new pieces of data, but you want to delete the oldest matrix data remove from that. It's like a sliding window. So it's hard to, I think you all understand it's hard to draw a picture, but it's easy to understand. Then for the third stage classification of voxel selection, and there are two phases, right? You compute kernel matrices. In this case, similar to normalization, you want to, um, you also have this sliding window, right? You want to get rid of the value from uh, the oldest co correlation matrix and add this thing in. So um, you can work out the details, but it's not that much computing. It's very little, actually. But for voxel selection, when you do cross-validation, that requires more work. Not as much as before, but that's where most of the work is. But the interesting thing is the voxel selection, this is like doing training, 
it doesn't have to update that often. Also, you only update between IPOC, which has a gap. That back gap is several seconds. So we've shown that you can actually do this with the current hardware without a much problem. And uh, so here is the, uh, so essentially what, you, what I'm showing is that this is very similar to the offline, except simpler. So if you um, make, uh, uh, how we do this is that we will, um, the offline analysis uh, break that task into many small modules, right? And some of the modules get to do more work and uh, for, um, for offline, but will do less work for um, online. And, but you need to have those implement sliding window type of implementation in the real-time system to make this whole thing work. So the difference, if you look at that, uh, you off online versus offline just requires a lot less computing. And uh, um, this is the, uh, the short summary. And the status of uh, the real-time functional full correlation matrix analysis system is that where um, if you go into a little deeper in the implementation detail, we're using the <coughs> ICAR uh, actor toolkit, which is uh, uh, initially our initial implementation of a uh, uh, offline analysis uses MPI as the communication mechanism and just because my student felt that was the easiest to do and a uh, reasonably high performance we have we replaced that with the uh, archive actor toolkit which using Scala uh, for uh, control and communication and, uh, and why do we have to do replacement because uh, uh, MPI communication mechanism does not assume, does not really allow you to have deal with the node failures. If a node fail, you would have to start over again. So, and, uh, so you want a connection-based communication mechanism that al can allow uh, node failures. And, uh, and in this toolkit, with this toolkit, you implement each module as an actor. So we have many, many actors. You just, that's the terminology, but the actor model was proposed by Hewitt back in 73. Okay, it's a, it's a good abstraction. So everything is an actor you, where everything, every module becomes a worker, right? Um, so with a, uh, this team of people uh, on the project have implemented this, right? Currently, the system run in real time. And, uh, the preliminary results shows that uh, w for in the infrequent phase of uh, that uh, voxel selection uh, class, uh, uh, that would need about uh, no more than 30 nodes to uh, finish within two seconds. I think that's actually too fast. So you should ju just uh, take uh, about 10 nodes and finish in five seconds. We have enough to, to be updated in the, during the gap between two epochs. So we're still in the middle of uh, um, uh, flashing out the, the whole design, even the basic uh, prototype system is working. And uh, other issues we're still working on, including resource allocation, tolerating node failures, and the debugging, well, experimenting with the different parameters. And this involves collaboration, not just the system people, but also with the neuroscientists, such as the, the sliding window. You want a window to be as small as possible uh, without affecting uh, neuroscience studies, and because that indicates how much memory resources you need uh, for, uh, for each. So to uh, conclude, I, I would just uh, say two things. One is, uh, in this project, we have demonstrated a functional a full correlation uh, matrix analysis can run efficiently on, on the Xeon 5 cluster in the offline fashion. Um, it can complete in minutes, um, but also have led to uh, new 
neuroscience discoveries. So this is a very you know, promising direction. And the second is that we're building this uh, real-time closed loop um, full correlation uh, matrix analysis is currently being built and it using the modules of the offline um, FACMA system. And they, this um, service may uh, lead to uh, more exciting new uh, neuroscience discoveries. So, and I want to thank you. And then there are some new recent papers uh, if, uh, uh, if any of you have interest. Thank you.